Thank you very much for tuning in on this session. In our 10 minutes, we want to focus on land enclosure in Kenya, and in particular, the current boom in practices of fencing and its associated rise in conflicts. Now, prior to the colonial era, both the Mara and the Laikipia Plateau were part of common grazing resource systems and home to semi-nomadic pastoralists. Today, fences and barbed wire are spreading at an unprecedented scale and pace across these areas. And although the establishment of conservancies seems to somehow slow down these processes, the trend is also striking even here. In many ways, the fences work contrary to well-established uh, systems of collective land governance, including grazing meetings and rotation systems. Instead, the fences introduce a completely other set of logics of coordination, communication, rhythm, planning and access. In many areas, this is causing huge problems of overgrazing and erosion, and the sort of security offered by common pastures during drought, for example, is no longer there. The fences are also deeply criticized from ecological perspectives, from which these processes seem irrational, short-sighted and selfish, referring to extremely high casualty figures for wildlife, which become entrapped in barbed wire or hindered in migrating or prevented from reaching vital grazing and water resources. So indeed, this looks like a classical tragedy of the commons. Now, historically, fences and the privatization of common land are deeply associated with state dominance, inequality, racism and oppression. However, paradoxically, these extensive processes of land enclosure are largely driven by Maasai land users themselves, many of which see these fences as new horizons of prosperity and autonomy, as reimaginations of regional futures. Now, this suggests that there's something intriguing here in the nexus between enclosure and its lodging in layers of political pasts, and also in the ways in which preceding forms of governance somehow continue to influence land tenure across longer timeframes. And it's exactly this that sparked our interest. So, Basically, what drives pastoralists to erect fences at this scale, contrary to interests in sustaining common pastures? And in which ways does the binding of land in fact become its own political deliberation? In order to unfold this further, we've conducted a series of case studies of negotiations of fencing within the Rift Valley region of Kenya. But being aware of time here, we'll just focus on two short cases, one being the Great Amara, which you just saw, where fencing is a quite recent phenomenon outside the urban areas, and the other one being the Laikipia Plateau, where fencing and defencing has taken place since the colonial era. In particular, we'll focus on this phenomenon across a longer time frame, on endurance and resonance of political decisions beyond materialism, in order to approach the layering of overlapping and co contradictory logics of governance. During the colonial era, land areas that previously functioned as customary resources or ethnic-based territories with moving frontiers now became lawfully categorized and mapped to determine which groups in society had the right to use and hold them. Categories included common land in so-called native reserves and private property principles for European settlers in the so-called crown lands. The Mara that Meta described before was at this time categories as native land only. But in Laikipia, as boundaries transformed from being plastic to being drawn on a map, they excluded land users who had previously had access. But as the mapped boundaries were not fenced, access across them often continued. By crossing the boundaries, pastoralists could acquire grazing and challenge the new boundaries. White settlers in the Crown lands saw this encroachment as a menace to white settlement. As a consequence, the settlers then gradually started to fence their boundaries, 
So the pressure leading to enclosure is different in Lycopia compared to the Mara, but the result is the same, fencing. With independence, the formal tenure system changed and African communities started to acquire private land on the former crown lands. Yet with different land use practices represented politically, the new constitution came to legitimize two processes of land claims, one based on presence and one based on paper. This made way for a movement across Kenya where groups challenged private property claims based on indigeneity. By now, this legal ambiguity has been taken out of the constitution, but the movement continues to hold power in people's minds and claims based on presence continue. Also, politicization of an opportunism had added more ambiguity in the way legal boundaries are authorized, and consequently loopholes and gray zones are allowed to grow and create a national. Let me give you an example of how the history of legal ambiguity continues to hold power and create contradicting dynamics between legal boundaries and moral claims against them. This is the legal boundary of Thorne. Legally or on paper, all land on the map is registered as private property. To the right is a white ranch under 100 year leasehold, and to the left is an area bought by smallholder farmers who nevertheless lived with tenure insecurity going on 40 years. The orange spots show areas that are farmed by the few smallholders who have settled despite this tenure insecurity. The legal insecurity has prevented most from settling, and so the rest of Thome is land that is formerly owned by the non-settled smallholders. The fact that it is seemingly vacant has opened the door for pastorals to settle with no legal tenure in these purple areas, and then occupy areas as territories for grazing in this pink area. Yet there is not enough grass in Thome, and the pastoralists are therefore dependent on accessing gra grazing across the fenced boundary to the ranch, marked here by red dots. So cutting holes in the fence is thereby also a type of opposition to the rancher's boundary claim. They defend their defencing via a moral argument that one should not be denied access to pasture, and statements such as, we don't really care about the title deed, that is just a paper. Our forefathers had no title deeds. We are using history. History has it that Lycopia was for the pastoralists. When they cut holes in the fence, they impose their land use system and express a non-recognition of the rancher's claim to the land and to the boundary. Meanwhile, the rancher on the other side supports his claim by saying, private land is private land. And if I decide to go onto someone's private land and do what I want, no one stops me, then something is wrong. So he continues to patch holes and reinforce the fence in a perpetual battle back and forth. In this way, we end up with these grid-like structures appearing on both juridical maps and on the ground, which are carrying a massive colonial and post-colonial heritage. In Mara, its appearance as fences is quite recent outside the urban and semi-urban areas. In Ikepia, it has kept layering and overlayering for decades, and points of opposition keep resurfacing around the demarcation and negotiation of these boundaries. So, once these boundaries are constructed as physical material boundaries, people keep struggling with them. These more fussy kinds of landscapes and commons have also recently been referred to as semi-commons or the new pastoral commons by Aaron Agraval and Charlotte Hess and challenge our understanding of what commons can be and can look like in year 2020. And returning to the fences in Mara, rather than seeing them as irrational, short-sighted or selfish, they provide an image of how people living in pastoral frontiers seem to be caught in post-colonial, decolonial and recolonial processes. An image of how long-term histories of colonialism, oppression and territorialization are not simply erased by law. And an image of how boundaries and fences seem to freeze and favor particular principles of governance fueling and accelerating land tenure conflicts at the same time as repairing 
and insisting on its own deliberation. Thank you very much for listening.